I was born in Akoma, in what is now Nigeria. My dad managed to get into the British Army, and my mum was already a teacher when I was born. So she was probably vital for him. She left me when I was two and a half, and my brother when he was six months, six or seven months, who came to England. So they came over here to do like, I, th I think it's a one year course, and come back. But unfortunately, the war started. Yeah. We lived with my grandma. My other grandma, my maternal grandma, died of hunger in front of us. I remember your beautiful smiling face. So kind, so good. And in our town, there were only mud huts. There was only two houses that had another story. And we all had individual little foxholes that we dug ourselves. So when the bomb started, you because being in your house was almost certain death. So you run out of your house, and you even if it's in the middle of the night, you run into the little, you know, self-made hole, and you cover it with the thing, and you just stay there until until it goes quiet. We were very, very brainwashed. I mean, they, they, our leader Ojuku used to have a broadcast in our language at seven o'clock every evening and it was for the children. And there would be like one radio in the village and we'd all gather around it and he would tell us to be strong, he would tell us to, you know, to watch out for the enemy. And, you know, the army used to come round and just kidnap the young men and make them go to war. And we can put a Kalishnikov together. Why? Because my 14-year-old cousin, Moses, he was in the army from when he was 12. And um, he'd killed many men. And no one could tell him off anymore. And he drank whiskey all day long. Unfortunately, he died on the last day of the war, you know, on his way home, because he was only a boy. I do remember my whole day was about trying to catch lizards with my catapult, which was you know, hit and miss. Um, I caught rats. I, I killed quite a few snakes. I, actually, I, I, I managed to get a taste for them. A fair taste of snakes when you're hungry. <laughs> um, and then, you know, one of the uh, local teacher went and told the Red Cross that we were orphans, even though our parents were in England. The Red Cross decided to give us one meal a day. And without the Red Cross, you know, we would have died definitely, for sure. Because that one meal a day was the only meal, you know. And um, you had to, you had to queue up all day for it. There would be like thousands of us in a long line from morning. And you just wait, you know, all day. And kids died in the line, you know. And you just kind of push, push that kid and move up one. And you kept on there. And um, the food the Red Cross used to give us, we had a name for it. It's called the Guampiti. And it's not an African word, it's just a name that we kids made for it. And it was basically cornmeal mixed with um, powdered milk and water in a big oil drum. For me, to, that is the most amazing food there's ever been. It, there's nothing that has ever tasted as beautiful as that. Even now, I taste it, you know, for me, it's, it's the food of the angels. You know, it was survival. At the end of the day, when they finished serving, then the kids would have a singing competition and the winner of the singing competition would be able to lick out the oil drum after they finish. But of course, you only got a little portion. So if you won the competition, you had the ability to have about five, you know, all the, you know, to lick it. You know, that was your job, you know? So you just go uh, you'd be licking, you know? Anyway, one day I did win that competition with a song. 
Ihe ni le zulo ke na la biafra. And me and my brother were inside this big oil drum because she's bigger than us. And we're licking the whole thing for hours and hours. And afterwards, even the next day, I saw him and I went, <laughs> lick him. <laughs> it was just amazing, you know. And that was one of the greatest days of my life. Nani sabu, sabu, sabu. But you know, it's a funny thing to say that we were actually more joyful than people are in Hackney. You know, but it's, it is a truth, you know. People, when they feel that they have no tomorrow, they have nothing left but to enjoy today. There was a refugee uh, program to send the, us to Gabon. And uh, that was during the time when my grandma wasn't very coherent and couldn't speak, you know, she was suffering. When they were lining us up to go to Gabon, she became coherent. And she came there, she went, parents were in England and, and yes, I'm taking them home and no, they're not going. And we were really disappointed because we were promised that when we went to Gabon, we would get food, we would get shelter. And my, my biggest ambition at that time was to go to school. And they said, you can go to school. So, you know, I couldn't understand why my grandma who couldn't afford to send me to school, was objecting me to going to school. I was very angry. But now, as an adult, I've learned that out of 250,000 children that went to Gabon, only 5,000 returned. It's like one of the most amazing things that could happen to a person because um, one minute I was, you know, herding a pig in the middle of a bush with no shoes on. This guy with a load of other kids who were bullying me. And then the next minute we saw this guy with a suit and tie coming in the bush and we thought it was, it was really weird. So, and then he came towards us and I was always in trouble. You know, because I was always hungry, so I was always like stealing food and stuff and getting caught. And um, he said, "Is there anybody here called Maurice Wilkage?" And I started to back out. And one of the guys who were bullying me said, "Yeah, that's him. That's him." As if, as if to catch him, catch him. And the guy said, "No, don't run." He said, "Don't run." He said, "I'm not here to harm you." He said, "I've been sent by your father, and you're going to." England. I was nine and um, I came with my brother who was seven. There was about six, seven adults to meet us and the most difficult thing was working out what's wrong with my parents. And I'd never seen my dad before. So I couldn't make out who he was. But my mum, it took me a little while because she'd put on a little weight and, you know, and um, she looked a bit different. And I, the last time I seen her, I was two and a half. So the fact that I remembered my mum made me have a little bit of a anchor. You know? So yeah, I knew, I knew she loved me and I knew that, you know. Oh, 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 me and my brother missed our grandma because she really was our parent, you know, she... Um, when we came here and met our parents, we were... They were strange people to us. I mean, we didn't even know we had a little brother, you know. It's in the morning that my brother uh, woke up and he said, who's, who's is that baby? My mum goes, don't you know? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know? But actually we'd had a, a brother the same year that we came. And I now realise the impact it must have had on my parents from having no children <laughs> to suddenly have the three in one year. One, a baby, and two, very traumatised more children. You know? And um, yeah, I take my hat off to mum, you know. I'm, I'm very kind of switched on to how she must have felt as a woman, you know, and watching that every day on the telly, seeing your children and not being able to contact them, not knowing if we were alive. And, and then the whole 
emotional thing of us coming back. So I'll always remember this house. This is my roots in this country. And if I had money, I would buy this house back. There was no England. This is England. This is, yeah, yeah. And we lived on that first floor. Uh, the family and me and my brother, our first room. And we'd never had a room before. We came from a mud hut to come here. So yeah, that was amazing. Except that uh, we had a sooty and sweet wallpaper, which I thought there were some demons sooty and sweet. And I was really scared of sooty and sweet. <laughs> it's funny coming from a war and killing snakes to eat and stuff, and then being spooked by sooty and sweet. My parents must have really gone to a lot of trouble to do up the room, you know, because they were getting these children. And then when we came, we, we spent all night scratching out the eyes of sooty and sweet, you know, so they couldn't look at us in the dark. You know? <laughs> and I remember here, this road, because we, we, we weren't used to cars and we weren't used to roads. So we were, in the first week, we were knocked down right there by a taxi and we had to go to hospital. And I remember my mum screaming saying what you know these children have survived the war <laughs> and as soon as I get them back <laughs> they're, dying, they're gonna die right here we didn't really realize the significance of traffic you know and back home we were used to just come out and play all day and um, and that's that's the one thing I noticed about being in England you couldn't go out and play you know you had to go to a lot of places to play <laughs> at a lot of times, <laughs> you know, which is ridiculous. And there was all these things we had to go to and then intensive feeding. Apparently I grew one foot in one year. first place I tasted chocolate. Oh, it was horrible. We were like, what is that? You know? And my dad had bought it for me and my brother. We was trying to like stash it away behind the car seat, you know? Because it was horrible. And we was going, oh, is it, is it? And we said, yes, it's nice. Because you know? we wanted to be like other children. We, we actually forced ourselves to like chocolate, you know, we kept eating it and, and then, because it was just so sweet. It just, you know, your mind went numb. It was just so sweet, you couldn't believe, and it was just horrible, you know? The only thing worse than, than chocolate was cheese. Yeah, mm. cheese, oh God, cheese was like eating, I don't know. I'd rather have had a roasted rat than a piece of cheese, that's for sure. Honestly, I don't think there's anything. Mm. When we came here, we used to, when my mum used to give us food, we used to go down later on at night and we used to take some bread and take some butter, take some jam and put it underneath our mattress. My mum now knows why, but it used to make her very angry because we'd, we'd have statues of food everywhere in the house and she'd, she'd get up in the morning and there'd be nothing in the fridge, you know, because we'd be statuing it because we didn't really understand that there'll be food tomorrow. I remember in an assembly, all the children, they all sing. And I can't speak English. So I used to sort of just sit there. And I, I noticed that all the white people make their mouth like this when they sing. <laughs> so I'd just be there going... <laughs> trying, to, <laughs> trying to just fit in, you know. I didn't have language, so I couldn't reply to anything. So the only thing I knew was that if you looked at me wrong, I'm going to attack you. My mum was regularly <laughs> summoned to school. <laughs> but the only English I know is he hit me first. <laughs> you know? That's it, you know. Once you hit me, that's it, we're going to die. And although I was smaller than the other kids, I've been farming. <laughs> Uh, you know, back home and um, fetching water and, and uh, fighting wild animals to eat them <laughs> and killing snakes since I was seven. So, I mean, the, the kids here, they didn't stand a chance at all. <laughs> <laughs>
So I had a campaign called Apples Are Good For Teeth, I remember that. And they brought in a clown and I've never been so frightened of anything in my life. If you were in the bush back home and you saw something like that, it would be like a voodoo man or something, you know, and, and, and you'd run for your life, you know. So uh, it took a lot of reassuring before I even came to school again. In Nigeria, everybody's black, so I'm not black, you know. And it's so funny when you're over here and you hear like Jamaicans or black Americans talk about the black community. Yeah. We gotta get the, but we gotta get unity. And then, hang on, where I come from, we can't have black unity because we're all black. <laughs> yeah. And also, um, so I'm not black. I'm just normal. And I do love Nigerians. They're beautiful people. Yoruba people are beautiful. I got some beautiful Yoruba friends. I don't think I'll ever be a Nigerian. I don't feel that you know you could kill half of my family and then say to me, "Oh, come and support my football team." It's not a process I think that I can go through. But perhaps by fostering what I went through, perhaps in the future, you know, perhaps my kids can can see that. But me, no, I, I can't forgive people who come and drop you know, bombs every day, at one time every day for one week on a village where there was only like three brick buildings in the whole village. It's all mud huts. You know, what enemy was there? You know, I, I can't, you know, I wouldn't have minded if it had, okay, it's happened, you know, and that's it. But no, it's happening now. There are kids like me now in Syria, in, in, in Somalia, in, you know, it's, it's, you know, and it's like nothing has got... We haven't learned anything except how to make even more destructiveness and, and, and even grown more. Like when they showed um, Biafran children on the telly in the 60s, it really shocked everybody. But now it's actually commonplace. Because the children coming now, they're not being treated how we were. Yeah, we had bad things because there were racism, there was all sorts of things going on in the society anyway. But there was no hatred towards us. There was there was a sort of the, the grown ups, you know, the, even on the telly, I remember John Lennon coming on there talking about Biafra. There was a there was a, a, a collective shock, you know, and almost a thing like, oh this shouldn't be like this. So how comes now that this is so commonplace now that, you know, my story is not even a story? You know, I'm sure in this school now, in this school now, there'll be so many more kids like me in, in this school. I, I haven't been since I was a kid, but I'm sure in this school, you know? I'm gonna let the sun shine in. I'm gonna let the sun shine in. I'm gonna let the sun shine in. I give thanks yeah. Yeah, to Hackney <laughs> and to the universe. <laughs> I can hear it in the air, I can hear it in the breeze, I can hear it everywhere, it's a whistle in the trees, I can hear it in my heart, I can feel it in my bones, I'll never be alone, I'll never be alone again. Sweetest song I 
Jaja sing the sweetest song I know.